Um, and now I want to get on so that we can spend the rest of the time uh, with our guest author. And I really first want to start by thanking her for being um, so willing to come on and talk with all of you, and also for taking the time yesterday to do a sound check with Scott and with me so that we could be sure that you would all get to hear her. So I want to introduce Mavonwe Collins. She's a Byfield resident and a debut novelist. And her novel that she'll be talking about with us today is Echo Location. I was um, really happy to meet Mavonwe last month. You remember that I was at AWP in Chicago. And I started out the um, webinar by, by just being wowed by all the excitement. And I want to remind you that AWP will be coming to Boston next March, and that this is going to be a great literary happening. It's kind of like a big literary road show that sets its tent down um, in a town for 10 days um, around the country. So um, Mavamwe and I uh, ran into each other at her publisher's table at the book fair, and I picked up her novel to read, which I read on the way home on the plane, and was really taken with it. And she and I connected over Facebook, all of these social media supporting old school uh, run-ins. And um, she's uh, here to talk with us today about the book. So hi, Mavonwe. Are you unmuted? Um, yes, I am. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Thank you for coming um, to talk with us. So let me tell you just before we get started, I just I should have said something a little bit about this novel. This is um, uh, set in what I think of as the rural outskirts of people, of places people visit when they go away from the city, um, when they're on their way to the country houses. Somewhere along the way, you will find a town like the one that Echolocation has at, the, at its core. Um, there is a strong figure at the center of this um, novel, and a and a family forms around her, and it's a family essentially of women. Um, and I don't want to say much more than that to get started, except to say that that's you know these assembled families. They are not the, they are not traditionally formed. There's a foster daughter who's who's a foster child who essentially becomes an adopted daughter. There's a niece that essentially becomes the sister to the foster child daughter. And there's an absent sister who eventually finds her way back um, to this town. Um, and I was wondering, Mavonwe, if um, you wouldn't mind giving us a little sense of the book, either by talking about it or maybe reading a little bit to us. Which... Oh, great. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me, first of all, Sharon, and for all of you to be here. And I want to say happy um, National Library Week to you. And uh, uh, Sharon, that was a perfect description of the town in which Echolocation is set, uh, the outskirts of um, kind of the resort area. Uh, it's, it's a town in the Adirondacks, um, which is similar to where I grew up in the Adirondack Mountains of New York State. And so that's always where my my home, my home voice goes to when I when I start to write something. Um, it's not I don't always set everything there, but it's sometimes where I feel like my soul exists. Um, so that's where echolocation is set. Um, I write in this book about characters who are also on the outskirts, um, living rurally and in poverty and um, without a whole lot of education. Um, so I thought what I'd do to give you a feel of it, which it's been described by one reviewer as Adirondack Noir. Um, <laughs> others, <laughs> that's good. That's along, good. And then others have called it Country Noir along uh, Daniel Woodrell's type of genre. Um, it's a literary thriller. And I thought I would give you a feel of it by reading the first chapter, which is very quick um, and intense. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll start by reading Great. the first chapter of Echolocation. When the slip of saw through trunk was buttery, liquid, and verging on gentle, Geneva was moved to tears. Her body felt as though it were cutting through the tree, the rings, the history of droughts and hailstorms, the sap that could have been her own blood dripping, weeping at her feet. 
It felt like a betrayal, this taking of saw to tree. But Clint was out of work again. They needed the money. She was down by the quarry, just off the old logging road, claiming a patch of ground Auntie Marie had given her for a wedding present, her dowry. Don't tell him, though, Marie suggested of the wooded acre. Keep that land to yourself. Geneva had thought of using the trees for sugaring, as Marie had proposed, but now it was too late. She was taking the trees for cheap firewood to sell to tourists at a roadside stand. Such a waste. The tinny song of wood thrush carried above other birds' calls. Eerie and mechanical, it was her favorite bird song, as if her fractured heart called out into the world. She paused before moving on to the next tree, listened above the idol of her saw while the song intensified, grew frantic. Warning? Was it warning her? No. The thrush was singing as it always had done and always would do. But she felt off that morning, a blue shakiness she couldn't otherwise explain. It didn't have anything to do with the fact that Clint hadn't come home the night before or that their electric bill was overdue. It was something else, something blurry around the edges. When she looked back on this day later, all she would think was, I should have known. She left her dog, Mr. Pink, behind that day because he'd gone gimpy in his left hind leg, and she thought maybe her bad feeling was about him. Another mistake she would later realize. Her bad feeling had nothing to do with Mr. Pink curled up on an old afghan by the wood stove. His leg was bad, and he didn't have much more time to live, but he would not die that day. He would spend his day warm and comfortable waiting for his next meal. As always, she checked the gauge of her old truck before she left home, noting that she had enough gas to drive to the trees and back. This was her biggest mistake. She would need that gas and then some. A full tank of gas would have made things turn out entirely different. Entirely. It was adrenaline that saved Geneva and pressure from the tourniquet she tied around her upper arm using her belt, her one good hand, and her teeth. After the saw kicked back and cut through the flesh of her left forearm, she sensed more than knew that she needed to move, that she needed to ignore the white lights flickering around her eyes and ignore especially the pain, the gushing blood. She needed to move. So that's what she'd done, tied the tourniquet and run to the truck, hopped in it and drove toward town, toward help. When the truck ran out of gas partway there, she didn't sit and wait for someone to notice. She got out of that truck and she ran like hell down the road, trailing pools and splatters of blood. She remembered thinking that the blood was an odd color on the pavement, iridescent like the tail of a My Little Pony. She marveled at her own blood as she ran, the leprechaun color of it, granting wishes. Terry Plunker saw her first and loaded her onto his ATV in search of help. It took some doing, though. By that time, she was in shock and babbling about the miracle of her blood. It will save you, she said. I have seen the truth in it. He knew women like this. He knew their kind, which was why Plunker was gentle and eased her into getting on the ATV. Set still now, he said, as he moved the vehicle forward. You sat still. Looked like a goddamn horror movie, is what he said after they got her safely to the clinic. Like that carry on the night of the prom. So much frickin' blood. So much blood, in fact. Plunker nearly passed out himself at the sign of it. Her arm was cut clean off, he said. Clean off. He sounded almost impressed, like he didn't know a man alive who could have survived what she had. Almost like he believed her arm would grow right back out of the stump. Regardless of everyone's best intentions, though, most of the arm could not be saved. And so beautiful Geneva would henceforth be known as one-armed Geneva. Still beautiful, but flawed. Clint felt so bad about his wife's disfigurement and how, had he been a better man, he might have prevented it, that he went down the street to the funeral home, met with the undertaker, and picked out a top-of-the-line casket, white, silver-handled, and pink silk, silk interior. There was no viewing, but there was a small service at the graveyard led by Father O'Connor. Geneva was there, dressed in black, mourning, and as they lowered the baby-sized casket that encased what was once her living arm, complete with engagement ring and wedding band still on the finger into the ground, Geneva dropped a shovel full of dirt on it, looked right at Clint, and said, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. 
Later she vowed those would be the last words she ever said to him. Ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for reading that. Um, it's quite a powerful beginning. And, uh, and uh, that, that image of burying her arm and burying her marriage all together was just great. Um, Thank you, Sharon. It's it's uh, it's it's interesting because this starts out being uh, you know a woman doing things against uh, her better judgment because of the marriage she came into, and then that marriage uh, you know leaves and and as I said, this becomes really a a a, a, a strong woman-centered group of um, characters in this house that we and store that we um, see for the rest of the novel. And, and I was wondering about that, um, about that woman-centered fiction. Is that something, um, is that an accident or were you, or is this something that you really did want to focus on? It's absolutely, that, thank you for picking up on that. It's absolutely something I wanted to focus on. Uh, it's very important to me. I grew up in the company of women and um, around many strong women. Uh, my father died when I was young, but both my parents had lots of female siblings. My father had four sisters and my mother had six sisters, so I had lots of aunties around me. And I, have, I myself have three sisters, um, so I feel like I understand women and particularly strong women who face adversity and so I'm always interested in them and, and how they live their lives or how they overcome uh, things, hurdles that are put in their path. Um, and so that's something that I want to explore in echolocation. And my publisher, Engine Books, um, has made a commitment to fiction by women, by and about women. Uh, they do publish some men, but mostly uh, she is committed to publi publishing as many women as she can. Wow, I, I didn't realize that. I hadn't quite looked at all of their lists yet. Um, very good. Um, you, I, I noticed that you, um, it, well, let me back up to say another way. I wanted you to talk a minute about the title. It's it's interesting that this is set, as you said, in a kind of an Adirondacks area, and the title very much evocative of the sea um, in echolocation. So I was just wondering about uh, okay. the title. Great. Yeah. Yes. Um, so from from my use of echolocation, I mean it for bats. Um, and they oh oh oh. Okay. Got it. So thematically, it's about um, these characters throwing their voices out into the void and hoping to make some connection that draws them home or leads them through the darkness. Um, okay, good. So that was my intention um, with the title. And bat there are a few like bats thrown in here and there throughout um, to, to help bring that home. Oh, I'm going to have to go back and look for them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's great. That's great. Well, listen. Um, when did you 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 said that you you go back to this home space when you're thinking about writing now? But your home space is now in Byfield, um, Massachusetts. Yes. I'm wondering yes. how long how long have you been here? And great question. I've lived in Massachusetts uh, since I think '91. I came to Clark in Worcester to go to grad school. Um, and I actually just finished my degree from there. I had finished all my coursework Yay. 20 years ago, but um, I didn't finish my thesis. And I, it, it came upon me that I should do that now. I have a, a small child, and I want to be able to show him how important I feel education is. And, it's a, and it was an important step for me, too. So I am now a Master of the Arts from Clark University. Oh, great. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. But M Massachusetts is absolutely my home. Uh, my husband and I love the North Shore. And we're so thrilled to be raising our son here. And I, I don't want to live anywhere else, actually. Even though, you know, the Adirondacks are my spiritual home or where, you know, my creative head goes sometimes. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is where I live and where I, I love to live. It'll be interesting to see when in your writing career you set something in Massachusetts. That will be ah. that will be interesting. Well, I have uh, done I have done short some short stories in Massachusetts. Yeah, good. for sure. But well, yeah. we're not we're not parochial, Mavon Way. We're, we're happy to read about the Adirondacks. <laughs> so that's great. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit of something to us about what it's like to be a first-time novelist, a debut novelist. 
and maybe even a little bit about finding your publisher. You're, you're with a small press from mm -hmm. Indianapolis, and so I think it would be really instructive for us to just hear about this whole process. We hear about how much the publishing world is changing and mm -hmm. how confusing it is sometimes to be um, trying to start out. Mm -hmm. Oh, the great question. Well, I've been writing for a long time. I wrote my first unpublished novel when I was um, a senior year undergraduate uh, school, so that was over 20 years ago. Um, and I, I've been writing short fiction, I've been freelance writing for a long time, but I had yet to um, sell a novel. Uh, and it was something that I very much wanted to do. Um, and so being a first-time published novelist is really exciting. It is a dream come true for me. It's also super scary because um, when your dream comes true, you, you know, you find out there's, there's a whole lot that comes with it and, and the work that you need to do to, to pay homage to it and to, mm. to make sure that, that you're getting as much out of it as you can and giving as much to it. It's like its own thing. Um, as far as finding my publisher, I had I have an agent, and she had um, shopped this particular book around New York. Um, and a lot of the publishers were like, "Well, we don't know what to do with it. It's literary, but it's a thriller, and you know." So they were not interested. But she and I were still very much interested and felt like it had legs. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was working. We were working on another project of mine, and I said, "Well." I see that Victoria Barrett, who's a woman that I admire, is opening this press called Engine Books, and I'd like to send it to her. And she said, sure, go ahead. So I did that, and not, not really expecting to hear back from her quickly or anything, and she immediately wanted the full manuscript, and then a couple weeks later she wrote back and made the offer to publish it. This was last July. Oh, um, great. Wow. Yes. Last <laughs> yeah. July. Yeah. <laughs> and in that email she said, okay, I, I want to publish this, but I have a suggestion for you. And so let's talk about this. The suggestion was to cut out one of the major characters and as soon as she said that I immediately knew that was the right thing to do for the book. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, so I cut out a, a major character, one whom I loved, and that was 20,000 words gone and it made the book so much better. And without her suggestion, I couldn't have done that because I couldn't see it. Oh. And I, I don't know that Previous, like, previously, if I had heard that from somebody, that I would have been able to act on it. It was the right time, the right suggestion coming from the right person, said in the right way. Um, so that made the book so much stronger. Because like, every time he came on the page, sh she said, you know, it stops. And, it, and the action stops. Oh, the yeah. Stops, yeah, changes. interesting. Right. So I was squishing this square peg into a round hole. Is he, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, is he mentioned at all, or is he completely no, he's gone? Completely oh, gone. Okay. Which was which was an interesting process because um, once I got him out of there, I didn't realize that then holes were left in the story because in my head the whole story was still there. So I needed outside. My, like my husband read it and said, "Well, why is it snowing here? You didn't say it was snowing over there." <laughs> it's because it oh, had because been. Because it had been in that other section. Right. Yeah. So, interesting. Yeah. So it was it was an interesting process, but I'm so lucky and thankful to be with this publisher for this first experience because we are truly in a partnership. Um, I'm empowered um, to, to promote this book in the way that I want to um, and she believes in it as much as I do and she's not going to give up on it after a couple of weeks of it being out. She's in it for the long haul. In fact, she and I are going to be on a panel at the end of the month at the Newburyport Literary Festival, which uh, the main day of that is April 28th, um, and we're going to be an author-editor panel. Um, oh, so that should be interesting. Yeah, there's going to be us and then a large publisher like Viking and an author from Viking or something. Yeah, so oh, that's, that sounds yeah. really interesting. And um, by the way, for everybody who, who doesn't know, and I should have included that in my announcements. We have two two weekends of festivals coming up. Mass right. Poetry Festival is next weekend in Salem and then the weekend after that is the wonderful Newburyport Literary Festival and that's what you should, I think it's NewburyportLiteraryFestival.org. Correct. It's not just Google it and see the events and that's a terrific, spreads all over the town. There'll be sessions in bookshops at the 
art, main art center, which used to be the fire hall, and just really all out and around the town, and it's really terrific um, the way it takes there, over. Actually. Is she? Yep, and some of the other people you mentioned on your awards, too. I, I volunteer for them as well, so I'm kind of... Oh, good. Yeah. That's great. Well, listen, so do try to get to the Newburyport Literary Festival if you can, but, but if you can't, I need to ask Mavon Way, will you come out to libraries? Do you do oh, reading? Absolutely. I, well, I'm a huge supporter of libraries, and I, I love reading in them. I've read in two so far, Rowley Public Library, and then the Arms Library in Shelburne Falls, Mass., and then I have one upcoming at Georgetown Peabody Library uh, at, in the end of May. And I love, I'm a huge supporter of libraries. I, uh, my mother used to volunteer in our school library in elementary school. Before I went to school, I'd go with her because my sisters were in school and I'd fall asleep on the shelves of the library in the bottom shelves. Um, so I, I grew up in a library, basically. And um, what my publisher and I do when I read at libraries is if you allow me to sell books, um, any book sold, we donate a a dollar back for any book sold to the library. Hear that? <laughs> that's so nice of you. We both that's really, really, believe really wonderful. No, that's terrific, and I'm glad I asked. Um, and I hope that um, I hope that we'll see you in some libraries soon. Before oh, we leave, and I know people are going to have to get back to work, but I just wanted to pause, and I should have done this um, sooner to just say, are there any questions anybody would like to chat in or raise their hand to pose? And Scott, I hope you're moder moderating this, because I can't see. I, I, I am. And uh, so far, I don't see any raised hands or questions. But uh, um, okay. as I, I, I did tell Mavon Way that most people were we're listening in at places where they wouldn't be able to talk. So I'm going to hope that that means that I posed all of the basic questions and that um, people can contact you through your website, I, I think, right? Mavonway Collins. Yep. And you can also um, message her through Facebook, which is what I did. And um, happily she answers. So um, thank you very much. And Thank you so much for coming, Mavonwe. I'm uh, clapping I, for you. I, Yay. I, thank you. <laughs> my, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for asking me, and thank you all for, um, for, for listening in. I appreciate it, and I hope to hear from you. Great. And I hope I'll see you in Newburyport. Okay. Yes. Take care, everyone, and I'm going to stay on the line for a minute with Scott if there are any questions. And Mavonwe, I'll talk with you soon. Okay. Thank you, thank Sharon. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Mavonwe. Thank Thanks, you. Scott. Thanks.